So it's strange, the matter he got, the stronger and more determined I became. I stared out of the kitchen window and watched the birds settle on the guard swing. They looked so peaceful as he yelled obscenities in my ear. The only sound I heard was their bird song and the sound of my tears breaking the surface of the dishwater. With my hands fully emerged in suds, I felt the sharpness of the Sunday carving knife. Careful not to cut myself, I took it in my hand, gripping it until my knuckles turned white. It would only take a second to take his life, but in that second I decided to remove something more precious than that, myself. My heart beat fast as I drew the blade above the surface of the water and held it there. I gave him a steely look. The blade caught the light and I smiled at him like a psycho. His jaw dropped. All it would have taken was a quick flick of the wrist for me to have blood in my hands. Jesus, he exclaimed, you wouldn't dare. Oh, I would, but there's nothing to gain from that, I said. He continued his onslaught of abuse, chicken, bitch and worse. I just smiled like a madwoman. What came out of my mouth next shocked me as much as he, as him. I was still clutching the knife. It's menace and cold blade, the only thing between us. I leaned in and whispered, I told you, never mess with an Irish woman. As funny as that sounds now, I was deadly serious at the time. I didn't need Dutch courage. I just needed the courage to get away from him and as quickly and safely as I could. Tired of the broken furniture and plates, the forced drinking sessions and sex, the snooping, stalking, me, stalking my every move, the yelling matches, name calling and threats, the jealous tantrums in the bar, making us live on leftovers, canned meat and out of date food. I set about blind it, building a secret life, a new bank account from a remote computer. It was important for my family to send money without him finding out. I became the stalker, tracking his daily movements. The time he got up, the time he went for a shift, stopped at the bar after work. The latter was a tricky one, as he wanted me to not only run him to the bar, but to stay with him and have a drink. Week one, I left my job and closed the door on my home and my life in Belfast for the last time. I packed the rest onto a lorry and in the back of my car. The three of us squeezed into the tight space between the suitcases and carefully packed wedding dress and shoes. I'd take my daughter out of her last term of primary school. Unforgivable, really. We were moving to England with a practical stranger and had a wedding to plan. We needed to leave. She would miss the end of term, a big thing for a primary seven. Not only did my daughter have to deal with the trauma of leaving family and school friends behind, she had a serious accident in school only a few days before. On the boat to England, she looked like she'd, been, she'd taken a beating from one of us. The next day, when the truckload of furniture arrived, my partner flexed his muscle, throwing the pieces into the hallway of his house. He damaged most of it there. It was a red flag. I had seen a few already, but none as violent as this. I knew then that I'd made a mistake. I did my best to find a place for everything that was salvageable and set about making his house our home. He wasn't pleased. On his return from work, he reorganised the furniture as before. Mine was saved in, the, saved in the conservatory. Week two, I signed on the brew. It would take six weeks before I got any money. I sent my CV to a few recruitment agencies and made appointments to see them. I met his two aunts, two angels. One was even called Angela. I was embarrassed because there wasn't a biscuit in the house when they called. And while his money sat in tidy columns on top of the kitchen counter, I couldn't spend a penny of it. I also had a wedding to organise. I nervously asked my family would they like to come, but I never got round to send the invitations. At this stage, we hadn't even got a wedding venue. Week three, I found a school for my daughter and accepted a home visit from the school liaison officer. I set about frantically cleaning the bird shit and dust from the living room. I cleaned out the cat litter that it lays thinking in its box for a week and I sent the cat to the ants for the day. I cleaned until my hands were raw. My partner managed to hold a temper for the hour long visit. We then visited wedding venues as if we were the perfect happy couple. It was rude to everyone 
I was so embarrassed. Week four, my daughter started the new school. I took her in the morning and collected her. It was hard for her. She was now part of a big school. My birthday came. The roots had grown out in my hair and I'd asked my partner to help pay for her hair appointment and to buy some much needed clothes as I'd lost over a stone in four weeks, but he refused to help. I paid for it myself with whatever little money I had left. He surprised me by showing up at uh, the hairdresser with a little pink bag in his hand. Great, I thought. He's bought me a present. But the man bought me £200 worth of vouchers for underwear. Seriously? We celebrated by going out for a meal. It was the first proper meal my daughter and I had ate in weeks. As he had turned the gas off on occasion so we couldn't cook on the range. He, he once said on a trip to the supermarket, these two are costing me a fortune. He had spent £80, his average weekly bill, at the supermarket, £50 if it was on drink. You know, I had to feed a family of three on 30 quid a week. Week five, I knew at this stage I was leaving him. I bought an open ticket for the ferry from Liverpool to Belfast. I didn't tell my family or his aunts who I'd had lunch with the day before. I didn't even tell my daughter's school. We were to take the ferry from Liverpool. I had no idea how I was going to, going to get away from him or even get there safely. I told my daughter of the plan on the morning we were leaving and said that I would pick her up from school as normal and not to mention it to anyone. Leaving day, week six. I started to pack our things as soon as we left for work that morning. I was careful to leave some mess and hide the evidence as best I could. My daughter got up from school an hour after he left for work. The shower wouldn't come on. He had switched the electric off and locked the cupboard to the meter. I brought her to school and picked up a lunch for her on the way. I sped home as quick as I could and picked up a speeding fine. I picked her up from school as normal. All was okay. I was calm. I knew what I was doing. The car was half packed. I just needed to get home and pack the rest. When I got home, we found we were locked out. He had, he had got home, got wind that we were leaving and gone back to work, locked up the house and gone back to work. I was mad. I jumped in the car and drove to his work, calling him out of a meeting, disgracing him in front of his peers. I demanded that he give me the key and only because he had, we had witnesses, he gave me the key. But within half an hour, he had followed us back home. I wished I had, a, had have explained to his boss what was happening or told someone, even his aunts. I put my daughter in the car and told her to stay there while I continued at the car in front of him. I was shaking like a leaf. I told my daughter to hold her hand on the horn if I didn't come back out of the house in time or to run to a neighbour to alert them. I was determined to get away. In the end, I pushed him away from, from, I pushed away from him, jumped into the car and sped off. It was 10 o'clock at night, three hours of a standoff with him later and four hours than I had planned. I drove to a friend's in Manchester, fast snake pass in foggy weather. I got lost on numerous occasions. I'd suddenly forgot my way around Manchester where I had lived for three years. I couldn't even find my way out of his city. The next morning we decided we headed to Liverpool. My daughter read out, um, from the GPS. I still missed our turn. I was a bundle of nerves and she was crying. There were 40 missed calls from my partner on my phone and several voicemails threatening us. He told us he was following us and we'd never make it home. I missed the slot for embarking on the ferry and rang ahead to tell him I would be late because of the circumstances. And I asked about getting on the next ferry. They told me to ring the police, but I was such a mess I couldn't. I just had to keep driving round and round in circles. Eventually, we got to the we got to the ferry. 
and the gates um, appeared to be open. A young fella signalled for me to come through the open gates. I wondered what this was about. I told him to keep the change from my ticket. He leaned over and said in a soft voice, be careful who you kiss next time. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Donna? Yes? Hello? Why do you do this to us? <laughs> Thank you so much. That was that was brilliant. I hope you can see the comments, by the way, because um, if you should be able to see them because they are they're very supportive. Same Thank you. Uh -huh. I, I, don't, I don't really have anything to say other than a wonderful, wonderful story and of an awful situation. And I hope anybody who's in that or any similar situation or knows anybody uh, can get the help that they need. So please, thank you so much. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank and you. I have to say, uh, <laughs> actually, it, it's quite focusing that we didn't see you, actually, because we just listened really intently. Yes, yes I think that was probably better because, um, you know me, I get, ner I get nervous. You could probably hear <laughs> the tension in the end, you know, but um, the thing about it, that was, it was such a nice story at the end because um, when I turned up the ferry ter terminal, I couldn't even find the word there to say terminal. Um, I wasn't expect I was expecting the gates to be closed and the ferry to be on its way. And it wasn't, I was on my way. I got out of the car. I went to the, to the office to buy a, a ticket for the next ferry because I thought I'd missed the slot. And this guy, young fella, just called me over, waved me over to the gates. I said, no, come on, we've been waiting on you. And I said, okay, I got in the car, drove there. And he says, we, 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 we got a message. We got a message. We were radioed through that you were coming and we held off until you got here. And that was just, I don't know, it was just like a guardian. He was just like a guardian angel. It was beautiful, you know. But I leaned over and they end on a, a good note. He says, just be careful who you kiss next time. Oh, that was lovely. <laughs> So thanks very much for listening and sorry for coming so late to the party. No, no, no. <laughs> it was well worth it, believe me. Well worth it. You're always value for money, Donna. You're brilliant. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.